Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. It's another Wednesday, another uh, episode of our LM TV. Uh, in particular, we're doing uh, Shockfest.tv today. For those who might not be familiar with this particular format, it's actually a, uh, a subset of our LM TV. Uh, it's one that is uh, designed and catered to the uh, normal attendance of the Shockfest uh, conference idea is to bring uh, fundamental technology to the audience and um, actually we have our, um, our, our, our very special guest today, uh, DC Porter from uh, Apostle Technology. Uh, good morning DC, I, I guess good morning right because you and I are in the That's same right. time zone. Yeah. DC, right. actually, DC, actually, DC is the founder and CEO of Apostle Technology of course uh, but in addition um, you actually started uh, with us uh, on the Shockfest.tv series. So you That's put right. up a very high bar, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and you're coming back and continuing with your topic on the fundamentals of TCP/IP. And if I understand it right, you're actually going to be explaining to us um, what IP is, right? That's right. So my goal with this series is to give some background to people who um, who are familiar with networking, may even be network engineers, um, know how to um, do everything with the network physically but may not understand the underlying technology, maybe had a class in it back in uh, college, maybe not even that. Um, and so this gives us an opportunity to kind of go through, well, what's actually happening with those packets as they, as they cross the network. So this is um, episode number three where we're going to focus on uh, the IP protocol. Okay, good. But let me just give me one second. Uh, let me let me also um, uh, quickly uh, introduce and, and welcome our uh, panel members, uh, uh, Tim O'Neill and uh, Tony Fortunato. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tony. Hey, guys. <laughs> hey, everybody. Okay, good. Okay, back to you, DZ. All right. Well, should I go ahead and get started? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Let me figure wait. out how to do uh, screen sharing. Uh, hmm. Okay. Are you able to see my yes, presentation? Yes, it's perfect. It's perfect. Good. We see it. Okay. So as uh, as I said, this is episode number three, where we're going to talk about the Internet Protocol, uh, or uh, Revenge of the Sixth. I know. Uh, Tim has some strong opinions. We'll talk about uh, mostly focus on IPv4, but um, briefly um, go into a little detail of uh, what IPv6 is about. So, um, just to to give you a refresh of what this series is about, we started off talking about uh, networking in general with networking layers, and then what is TCP/IP in general. So now we're going to drill down into uh, into the various protocols and uh, and what's going on there. So today, uh, the most important underlying protocol is uh, is IP. So a little bit of um, um, we'll start with a little bit of recap. We'll talk about the assumptions of uh, what IP, what assumptions are behind IP, and therefore why it was developed the way it was. Um, routing and fragmentation, its uh, most important uh, functionality. What an IP datagram is like, uh, and then we'll get into a little discussion of IPv6. So just to recap, because every discussion of networking has to start off with a uh, picture of the OSI model. There's seven layers. Um, the first two are the physical network itself. Then we have um, the network or IP. Uh, then above that we have the transport protocols, TCP and UDP, and then above that the, uh, the application uh, layer protocols. And in fact, for the internet itself, that seven layer model doesn't actually make a lot of sense. We usually talk about it as the physical network, the internet layer, transport layer, and then the application layer. So when we look at a packet, it's layers inside layers inside layers. So we have an Ethernet packet here, which has an Ethernet header, and then an Ethernet payload. Part of that payload is the IP header, uh, or the IP packet, sorry, IP datagram. And uh, the IP datagram has an IP header and, within, uh, and then a payload. Uh, and part of that payload is the TCP packet, which has a TCP header and uh, application 
data, and then there may be uh, application layer uh, headers and uh, and details inside. So we have layers and layers inside layers. It may not be quite as neat as this because the packets don't always line up as one TCP packet inside one IP packet inside one Ethernet packet, but this gives you the idea of what a packet looks like. If you're used to using Wireshark, you probably see this all the time because it gives you the different layers. When we look at um, how IP networking works, and I showed this diagram in a, in a previous presentation, uh, previous episode, IP is kind of the glue that holds everything together, and that's why I say it's the most important layer. Below that, we can have any sort of physical network, and as long as um, there's a driver written so that it can run over an IP network, we can use any kind of physical network, whether that is Ethernet, whether that is a satellite network, whether I've even seen IP run over um, uh, barbed wire kind of lossy, it wasn't really designed for it, but as long as you can write a driver that will connect to that, then uh, then you can use it. Um, above IP, we have our transport protocols. We have the built-in ones, TCP and UDP, but you can write your own if you want, as long as it connects into the IP network. And then above those, you have whatever application you want. And anybody can write any application to run over any protocol, but everything runs over IP. That wasn't always the case. There used to be all sorts of transport layer protocols, but this is what created the internet, was it is an IP uh, protocol network, and everyone is using it, and uh, therefore everybody can communicate with everybody else, and we now have the modern world in, a, uh, in one diagram. So our core protocols for TCP IP are obviously IP, and IP moves the packets from one side of the network to the other side of the network, hop by hop. And then we have our end-to-end -end protocols, TCP and UDP, which are um, responsible for communications between the two end nodes. And we look at a diagram here, we can see a little bit clearer that the source and destination devices um, are going to have applications running which will um, hand the data off to TCP, which hands it off to UDP, and on the other side, the, uh, the, the application data goes from uh, IP up to TCP to the application to the end user. But in the middle, there's really no concept of TCP or UDP or application data. There's just packets moving across the network. And it goes hop by hop. Uh, it physically comes into a router. Uh, the router has a... Um, has IP running on it in order to be able to route it to the next hop, and it goes hop by hop at IP layer but until it gets to the end node. So the fact that it's running a particular protocol, TCP, UDP, or something else, is kind of irrelevant until you get to the end nodes. This is the traditional view of networking. Things have gotten a lot more complicated uh, with all sorts of boxes in the middle for security and performance and proxies and everything else that um, essentially have to act like a source or destination device um, but fundamentally, this is the way IP networking works. TCP or UDP on the end nodes with the applications, IP in the middle, hop by hop moving packets across the network. The way IP was designed uh, has some basic assumptions in it, and these were a big change from what had come before, which was uh, circuit switching, your traditional uh, telephone network. And the idea was, uh, with a telephone network, you have dumb terminals, your telephones, they really are, you know, essentially nothing but a microphone and a, uh, uh, and, uh, and a speaker and a bell to tell you that it's, that it's ringing. Um, but the intelligence is all in the switches in the middle that have to create a circuit between those two endpoints and keep it open or tell you that it's not, uh, that there's no circuit available. The idea, that worked great, except it's not, uh, particularly efficient, especially you're talking most of the time is dead noise, but you're using up a circuit. The idea with um, packet switching, which is what uh, modern networking is, is that we divide that up into packets, and these packets go across the network, and they can use the bandwidth much more efficiently. If there's nothing being sent, then it's not using any bandwidth, um, and it makes things much easier to share. It makes things much easier to uh, to be flexible, we can add new networks, we can add new, de new devices just by, you know, pressing a switch and adding them instead of having to reconfigure these massive uh, communication equipment that's sitting in a hub somewhere. So based on that, we have some, uh, some important assumptions. One is that our network is unreliable. 
Um, a node is kind of a stupid device. It may uh, somebody may add one, ones may disappear at any time. So every packet needs to be routed independently. When we send one packet to the next packet, we don't know what that network is going to look like. It doesn't really change all that much, but the basic assumption is from packet to packet, that network may have changed. Um, even if the network didn't disappear, it may have gotten congested. There may be a different way to send the next packet. Um, if there's too much packet, uh, too much traffic, we throw away whatever is uh, the, the excess. Um, so again, stupid network. Uh, the intelligence is in the end nodes, and so that's why TCP, uh, which has the control of how quickly things are going to be sent, um, is in the end nodes, not in the routers, which are um, essentially very simple devices, or at least they used to be. Um, and best effort service is sufficient. We don't need to guarantee a certain amount of bandwidth to any individual user or any stream. Everyone's competing for bandwidth, and as long as it's done fairly, that is good enough. Things have changed again, but that's the basic concept behind uh, that went into the design of IP. And then, oops, uh, stability is more important than uh, performance, so we make our protocol design very uh, um, very conservative to make sure that things don't collapse, even if it's not as efficient as it uh, as it could be. And all these things were designed in the 1970s and 80s when you know 56 kilobits was a uh, was about the best you were going to get for for bandwidth. Things have changed dramatically since then, but the protocols haven't. So when we look at IP itself, it's a simple protocol for transporting packets across any type of network. Uh, exactly what it says. Um, it, it's on the routers, and it, it passes packets uh, hop by hop, router by router, from one side of the network to the other side of the network. We call those packets uh, datagrams, and IP has two fundamental uh, functions. One is the obvious one of routing packets from one side of the network to the other, uh, and then the other one is fragmentation and reassembly of packets that are too large to cross, the, uh, cross part of the network. IP is what's called a best effort protocol. It's unreliable. Um, if there's too much traffic, remember, uh, you may have a gigabit network connected to a DSL line with 10 megabits. So, um, you know, if you're trying to stream a gigabit per second, you hit that 10 megabit link, it's not, you're going to have a lot more traffic than, than can go over that, uh, that intermediate path. So the excess gets thrown away. That's the way IP works. Uh, if packets are corrupted, it throws them away. Uh, traditionally, there's no notification to anyone, so it's up to the end nodes to figure out what's been lost and uh, what needs to be retransmitted. It is what's called a connectionless protocol. Um, the network conditions may be changing. Uh, the infrastructure may be changing, so every packet is independent of every other packet. So just because one packet was routed one way, the next packet that comes along, the router doesn't know anything about the fact that they're from the same stream or the same user. It's just routing each packet uh, independently, and things may have changed in, uh, during that time. So when we look at routing, routing is a very simple concept. The how to make it work is complex, but the basic concept is at every interconnection point on the network, we have a device that we call a router, and it has a table. So a packet comes in uh, into the router in one interface. It looks at the destination address. It looks up that address in a table, and the table says, send that packet out um, to the next router through this interface. And that's all it does, fundamentally. Um, so every packet comes in, looks at the destination address, uh, sends it out the next, sends it out another interface to the uh, to the next device until it reaches what's called the um, the last hop router, which knows which, which is directly connected to that IP address. Simple concept, but these tables can be very large. Um, we're not putting these in by hand anymore, so we have very complex protocols for router-to-router -router communication to decide what that table looks like uh, and how the the routers know what the next hop is for for each packet. Um, so that's very complex, but the fundamental concept of 
you look at the destination address, you look it up in a table, you send it out the interface is what a router does. Sometimes the, um, the, the maximum size of the uh, physical layer frame is different uh, depending on what sort of a network it is. So if we have an Ethernet network, traditionally maximum frame size was 1526 bytes, which has a payload of 1500 bytes. Uh, nowadays there's jumbo frames, but uh, traditionally it's 1526. Different uh, physical networks may have uh, different um, packet sizes, frame sizes, and so if you imagine you have an Ethernet frame that's um, 1526 bytes, um, and it hits a network that has a maximum size of 500, uh, call it 500 bytes, what happens to that packet? We cannot send those 1500 uh, bytes over a, uh, as, as one packet over a uh, network that can't handle it. So IP will split that up into multiple packets. We call that fragmentation. It's very simple that it, um, it is just breaking it up into multiple packets, putting a new header on each one, and um, and putting a you know, some information so that the end node can know that these were pieces of a fragment and put them all together. It doesn't do that very efficiently, and so we try to avoid it. But um, that is an important um, part of what IP does. The, you know, we could send everything with a very, very small packet, but we don't want to do that because each packet has its own header that uses up uh, bandwidth. Um, also, small packets means more packets, means um, more load on the router, because if you imagine what the router is primarily doing is looking up each, taking in a packet, looking it up in a table, and sending it off. If we have small packets, that's more more work for the same amount of data. So we try to send the largest packet that we can for the uh, for the given network. Uh, I think I've already covered this. Um, we one thing we can do is break it up into smaller packets. Nowadays, what we do is uh, called um, MTU Discovery Maximum Transmission Unit, um, which um, will is, is a protocol that the end nodes figure out what the maximum size is that can be sent. Basically, it tries to send a packet. Um, if it um, if it's too large for a network in the middle, the router sends back a message saying, "Sorry, too big, can't uh, can't transfer it." But the largest size that you can send is this much. And then the end node tries sending another packet at that much, and if it gets stuck somewhere along the way, it gets a message back saying, "Ah, oh, sorry, that network has even a smaller value." Uh, eventually, it will figure out what it is, what the maximum size is, and then it caches that value for that end node, and uh, will always send at that um, at that largest packet that that path can handle. Periodically, again, the the network may have changed along the way, um, the routing may have changed, so um, to, to the end nodes, so we periodically check and see if um, uh, if a larger packet can can, uh, can make it. So this is what an IP datagram looks like: a uh, bunch of fields, and I'm going to go through each one of them uh, in the header, uh, addresses, and then the the data itself, which may include the the upper layer protocol headers. So we have a version number, which for these datagrams is going to be version four. We have the length of the header. Uh, there may be optional fields, so we have to tell the router how big the uh, the header is going to be, uh, so it knows where to look for things. We have a, a type of service indicator, which is used for class of service. We have the total length, including the header, because it again packet size is variable, so we need to know where the the last byte is going to be. Uh, if there's fragments, we need to know uh, what's the sequence number of the of the fragment, so we can reassemble things back in order. Um, there's a flag to say whether it's a fragment or not and, uh, and, and where this fits into the original. Uh, we have something called time to live, which is um, the number, the remaining number of hops that the packet is, is allowed to be sent. Because if uh, we end up with a loop where, because of a routing error, the packets are going around and around in circles, we don't want those building up and, and going forever. So we have a limit uh, that says, uh, that we count down each hop along the way. We reduce that by one. When it gets to zero, the packet gets thrown away. Uh, and then we have an indicator for what is the um, the upper layer, the transport layer protocol inside. That would be six for TCP, 17 for UDP. There's a bunch of others defined that uh, that can be put in there. We have a header checksum 
For IP, we're only checking that the header is correct. We're not checking that the data itself um, has not been corrupted. But if the header has been corrupted, then we don't necessarily know where the end node is. Um, so we have to throw it away. So there's a checksum for the header that's checked each hop along the way. Um, and then we have our source address, 32 bits, our destination address, 32 bits, options, which we don't use much more. And then everything is done in terms of 32-bit uh, words. So if there's any space left over, uh, we need to add in some padding. That's IPv4 in a nutshell. IPv4 is great. In fact, it's so great, uh, nobody wants to stop using it. Um, it was designed, originally specified in 1981 in RFC 791. It has the the addresses are uh, in 32 uh, 32 bit words, so we have two to 32 bit address, which if you do the the math comes out to about 4.3 billion addresses. Well, in 1981, 4.3 billion addresses seemed like an ungodly large number of addresses that we'd never use up, and nowadays, well, we need a lot more than that because uh, now pretty much everyone is connected to the internet. We have multiple devices connected to the internet. Everybody needs an IP address. Uh, and of those two to the 32, there's a lot that are reserved for special use, like multicast. There's more that um, they were given out in blocks, and some of those blocks are large, and not everyone, not all of them are being used by that um, in that block. Um, so at this point, we've gotten to the point where there really are no more uh, addresses remaining other than ones that have already been allocated and aren't being used. So the idea that uh, that was supposed to be the solution uh, that people started working on in the early 90s was uh, called IPv6. I'm sure everyone here has heard of IPv6. The main difference between IPv4 and IPv6 is we have uh, addressing in 128 bits instead of 32 bits. So Two to the 128th, I don't even know how large a number that is. It's hard to describe. Um, somebody once told me that it works out to being that we could give a separate IP address to every grain of sand on the Earth. Um, and I say, well, what happens when we start needing uh, addresses for grains of sand and other planets? And I guess at that point, we're on to IPv7. But um, for now, uh, two to the 128th should be good enough. And that's great, except we now have a packet that looks completely different than an IPv4 packet, and our routers were designed for IPv4, and they're not backwards compatible with each other. So we have a little bit of a mess. Back in the early 90s, the idea was, well, we would just switch over. We'd bite the bullet, we'd make the switch, it would be painful, but we'd get it done. Uh, that was easy when, you know, there were a handful of, uh, of ISPs and, and a few institutions. Uh, that world is long gone, and we didn't make the switch, and now we're, we're, we're still trying to figure out how to get this done. Uh, IPv6 was designed in 2005, and here we are 10 years later, and we haven't made very much progress. Um, we didn't really have much NAT at the time. I'm sure most people are familiar with NAT. So the, uh, when we were looking at IPv6, everyone needed their own address for every device. Um, and so you'd quickly run out of addresses. My office I was in, you know, we had 25 people and we had a, a Class C 128 address block that covered all of the PCs and printers and everything else. Um, nowadays, that same office probably has one or maybe three addresses that are globally routable. And then we have NAT, so everything's on a 192 or, or a, a 1000 address locally. And we use a lot fewer addresses that we want. Um, there's some downsides to that. There's some things that we can't do because everything doesn't isn't globally routable anymore. But um, NAT has made a huge difference in the ability to do a, a lot with a, a with uh, much fewer addresses than we needed before. So that took away a lot of the pressure to get it done, um, and we now have this worldwide infrastructure of billions of users and 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 hundreds of millions of addresses, if not billions of addresses, and getting everything switched over from one protocol to another means essentially switching out all the routers and, uh, and all the devices, and yeah, uh, not happening. 
So we came up with all of these transition mechanisms so you could keep using IPv4 and run it over an IPv6 network, or new devices could have IPv6 but run over an IPv4 network, and they're all there, um, but they're not being used very much. Um, a lot of people are, are afraid to switch over to IPv6 because it's kind of untested. Uh, there's probably a lot of uh, security holes. IP, IPv4, there's security holes there. They've been, uh, they've been found and trounced, and uh, um, people are on top of that. IPv6 is just going to open up a whole second set of, uh, of issues that we haven't really gotten into, so people don't want to touch it if they don't have to. Uh, in the end, it comes down to a lot of pain no obvious gain, uh, so nobody wants to do it until they absolutely have to, which um, means nobody's really done it yet. Uh, there are some advantages to IPv6. When they designed it, there were some inefficiencies in IPv4. Um, path MTU discovery instead of fragmentation. Um, IPsec was designed for IPv6. Uh, mobile IP was designed for IPv6, and everyone said, wow, those are great ideas. We want that, but we don't want to deal with IPv6. So all of those were backwards integrated into IPv4, which took even more of the pressure off of uh, the transition to IPv6. So this is what an IPv6 packet looks like, and you can see it's a lot simpler. We have much fewer fields. Uh, it was designed to make routing more efficient. It was designed to make it easier for routers. It turns out to be not as important as it was in the 90s because routers have gotten a lot more powerful than they, uh, than they were then. Uh, but we have a very simple uh, packet, uh, version of 6. We have a type of service. We have a flow label so that instead of routing each packet independently, we can say, well, this is part of a flow of packets that uh, I've already figured out where what the source and destination addresses are. It's the same as the last one that came, so I'm just going to do the same thing. So um, that's going to simplify the, the routing. We can look at this label very quickly and just pass it on. Um, our, our length, we still need to know that. And uh, there are some optional headers, so we, we do have a field for that. And we do have a hop limit. And then we have source and destina destination address. So no fragmentation. Um, we use path MTU discovery to figure out what the maximum packet size is, and that's what we send at. We don't do fragmentation, because that's really painful for routers and not very efficient. So simpler protocol, but not compatible with IPv4. So we're kind of stuck in this. Uh, no man's land at the moment of, well, we've run out of IPv4 addresses, but we don't have an IPv6 infrastructure. What do we do? And uh, everyone's just kind of waiting for the time when they get forced into IPv6. So that is uh, the end of the, uh, the slideshow. Let me uh, turn off sharing so we can see me again and give you a chance for, uh, for some questions. Thank you, DC. And we even uh, have battery to spare. It looks that way. We've got about 30 minutes left. <laughs> well, I think I owed it to, to Tim to give him at least a few seconds to make some yes, comments. Yes, I know we but, have an IPv6 hater. And well, I'm, but, but let, me, let, me, let me give, let me give uh, Tim the proper warning. Um, Tim, um, you, have, you can only do one thing today, so you have to decide which one you hate more, IPv6 <laughs> or Spanport. <laughs> <laughs> On the grounds that it may tend to incriminate me, I refuse to answer that question. Um, <laughs> Take my Fifth Amendment rights. No, first off, I don't hate IPv6. I was on the NG committee and worked very diligently at Network General to get the NG adoption, uh, which was really the fundamentals that we found out that were missing from IPv4 uh, and would have given us the 340 gazillion addresses, one for every grand of sand and every human body and everything else we could find. Um, I don't hate IPv6. I hate what's been done with IPv6. You know, one of the complexities of IPv6, not only the cost, but there's like 700 standards that one has to go through, and no one has ever come up with a, if you can do, you know, this RFC and this RFC and this RFC, you're now IPv6 compatible. There's no common point. Someone will say, well, I'm IPv6 compatible, and you ask them what that means, and they're like, um, we can handle, you know, the 128-bit addresses. No, that doesn't mean you're compatible. Because as you well pointed out, there are a ton of holes in IPv6. Even running duplicate stacks, uh, people are finding out. Tony found out by a friend of his running a, putting in a print server that took his network down. Um, but running dual stacks, um, Black Hat and a whole bunch of the security organizations have shown how hackers can get into computers and networks 
by using that open stack because they're not really don't have any protection for IPv6. So I'm not against it. What I would like to see is someone say to do this, these five standards would make you compatible. You know, so in other words, come up with some compatibility levels as opposed to kind of throwing it out there, you know, and trying to feed the chickens when the cows are hungry. It's not working that way. And a lot of the recent uh, ad adoptions for IPv6 are by governments for taxation, uh, for control, and again, I'm against the internet being controlled uh, to some extent. I'd like to control the dark side of the internet, but I, I think people should have the right to go look at whatever they want. Um, so, number one, I'm not an IPv6 hater. I think it's great, and I worked very diligently back in the late 90s with the, uh, the Network General adopting the NG format. Uh, and back in 1998, when the ITU said, oh, we're gonna, now we're going to call this an, I, an IPv6 standard, uh, between then and now, there's hundreds of standards have been put in place with it, and that's what's confusing. And, and, and the other thing is, like you pointed out very aptly, what is the motivation to move to IPv6 when we can use NAT for a while? Uh, it's doing pretty well right now. Yeah, it's confusing, and we'd like to have an address for the network of things, for everything in your home to have a, an IP address. Uh, uh, but there's no financial uh, benefit right now. And like you pointed out, nothing's compatible with IPv4. IPv6, certainly. It, it, it's not like you can, you can add some features to IPv4 and then be IPv6 compatible. You have to terminate IPv4 completely. All of your applications, all your components, all your computers, your cell phones, everything has to be changed. And that's not going to happen without some really dynamic demand or need or solution value. And that's what's killing IPv6, and I think that's wrong. I totally agree. I'd like to have IPv6. I think the new routing protocols and some of the things could really help us, but uh, certainly help in the security world. Uh, but it, until we fix those problems and get some reasonability or some reason, reasonability. You know, Tim, um, I, you know, I, I, I don't speak uh, uh, ill of the Chinese government, uh, but I do know that they're trying everything they can to control their own citizens, putting up firewalls and and uh, uh, making sure that all devices sold in China have back doors. But wouldn't it be easier if they just enforce IPv6 all across the country? Wouldn't that just like do exactly what they want to do, make everything incompatible, and they can control everything, right? Affirmative. <laughs> there was an estimate done by the uh, international uh, ITU, um, and I think the estimate was right now if we told everybody they had to switch over to IPv6, no one was going to, you know, we're going to get rid of all the, the uh, IPv4 server classes and it was going to be an IPv6 network. It would cost in the trillions of dollars, and most businesses would be shut down because they couldn't yeah. afford the outlay. So, Tim, take a step back. What, what, in, in addition to making comments on IPv6, um, what do you think of um, DC's presentation today? I think it was great. I think it's a, the people have got to learn the fundamentals. They, Tony, you've seen it. Chris, you've seen it. DC, you've seen it for sure. People are in charge of monitoring a network, and uh, I know this sounds as a very bad indictment, but one time, Joe Combs and I were talking with Vince Cerf, and we, you know, I threw out the question: How many people do you think really understand how to troubleshoot a basic TCP/IP flow? You know, how to understand that? And the number that threw out was like less than, you know, five, maybe ten percent of the people that are charged with networks, uh, management, control, security, and things like that. And what DC pointed out some very great basics that people have to start making an effort to learn, uh, especially now that we're trying to do testing and mitigation of attacks, recognition. I mean, if you don't understand the patient, the fundamentals of your patient, their temperature, their heart rate, their pulse, their chest sounds, their heart sounds, you know, uh, if you don't have the basics, you're not going to take care of the stuff on the upper layer because you won't know what's going on, and that's mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. And Tony, I mean, you've seen that before uh, in your consulting role, how many people just can't handle a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Go ahead, Tony. 
Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Tim's right. I can't even argue with him. He's he's 100 percent right. He's um, there's a lot of the fundamentals missing, and and I'm finding it's uh, coming home to roost in the last two years, uh, for two reasons. One, security. People can't understand security um, issues when they don't understand the basics. But you know what I'm finding too? People are migrating to the cloud for VoIP and data and application services. And guess what? It never worked that great locally. But all these protocols tend to fix themselves and recover, right? They're fairly resilient. Um, and guess what? It's not doing that now when you go across the cloud because you have a router and the fragmentations become an issue or ICMP isn't allowed to go through. And all the little things you had working for you in the background locally are gone now. And people are looking at these problems like they're new. And they were never new. The errors and the protocols have always been there. You just never looked at them and didn't understand what the implications were when you left your building, right, or your network. So I'm finding this, um, I'm getting quite a few calls now, quote, unquote, we've gone to, you know, cloud service X, and the application is, is awful, the performance sucks, and we get disconnected, and, you know, that dumb carrier and that stupid cloud service, and no, it's, it's so far it's been your problem, and you've had it from day one, you just didn't know it was there. And it just got, now you just notice because guess what? You have to leave your network. You have this router there that you never had to worry about, or a firewall, or a proxy, or whatever. So yeah, I guess that's that's me venting. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I I think what I've seen and what I tried to do back when I was at NG and at ClearSight is I try to get people to buy emulators and actually try to test their network uh, <clears throat> and their products that they were buying and using and. I think that's another issue. People don't buy, don't buy into the fact that I want to test it. I need to test it. I need to uh, to learn about it. Where the emulators that are out there today are so easy. I mean, DC sent me one that uh, I've got. I've been using, and it's awesome. I mean, it's so simple to use. I don't know why anybody wouldn't have an emulator uh, in their back pocket, um, and that teaches you a lot because you can change things and you can take trace files and play them back. Uh, I actually tried it for, uh, I took the thing you gave me DC and played back uh, some attacks uh, on a computer and wow, I mean I learned so much on how the attacks were handled the the, 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 the way the, the network tried to fight it. And uh, so you know, if I was, if someone came to me today, and I do teach a little bit, if some people think I have some knowledge, I tell them, I said, buy an emulator, mm -hmm. and play with it, and then then learn how to test your network because that way you learn by you know attrition really. I mean, it's, you don't have a choice. I want to go back to 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 one of the things that, that Tony said in passing, and and because it just it just um I was very sensitive to it because I have heard it more than once, which is that um. Things are getting so complicated. The technology is moving so fast, but yet um, we actually want more knowledgeable customer. We actually want customers that have a, a better uh, understanding, uh, more fundamental, you know, better understanding of fundamentals. It, it's not like it doesn't. You know, suppose you're the best chef in the world, and the rest, but but no one has taste buds. You know, what's the <laughs> point, right? Um, so with that, I want to I want to come back to DC and then maybe to Chris in a minute uh, because both um, uh, Chris just joined us by the way, and because both DC and 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 Chris, in addition to being technologists, they also have their own company. They're vendors, so they they tend to look at things a little bit differently. Uh, DC, how, how do you? I know. I, I know. First of all, again and again, I really appreciate you coming to LMTV and and uh, putting up some really um, uh, great material. But as a vendor, um, is do, do you also find that that is important that to to I, I wouldn't say educate, but at least raise the level of awareness to the, of the customer. Do, do you also see that? Absolutely, and, and you know, thanks Tim for the uh, for the pitch. Um, the uh, we we make network emulators, and um, the point is that you need to to test your applications. We're going to be talking in in the uh, the rest of the series uh, more about the upper layer, especially TCP/IP, and um, you know it, it works great when you have no latency, you have no loss, you're on a local network, you start going in a cloud environment, you start going in a cl uh, client server environment, and things don't work the way you expect them to. So it's always been an important part of my job to help educate the 
the customers and and the world in in general that you know here's how the protocols work uh, here's what they're doing when they're on a local network here's what they are doing when they are on a uh, a long distance network and they're not going to be the same thing at least from the performance point of view and you may be surprised because you're used to working on a local network and things worked great now you put them onto a uh, um, you know, you put them on the cloud and things don't work the same way anymore. Sometimes the vendors or, or your team is, has kind of built it for that environment, and uh, but a lot of times they haven't. So um, rather than customers being surprised that things didn't work quite the way they expected, um, and latency and packet loss tend to be the surprising things. Everyone understands bandwidth, you know. The application is going to stream at five megabits, and I only have one megabit of bandwidth. It's not going to work, but uh, I've got 100 megabits, and so things are supposed to work. But it turns out I've got uh, 100 milliseconds of latency, and the application isn't uh, dealing with that well. Um, part of my job is is getting people to understand that, and then giving them the tools to um, to help them be able to test and and optimize for for those environments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. We, used to, we used to always tell people that bandwidth was was not some number you took out of the sky that you paid for. Bandwidth was a denominator of of delay. And if if you have 100 milliseconds of bandwidth or delay, that's really what your bandwidth turns out is time over frequency, one over time frequency. And it just that's a way to relate it. And people don't test. Gosh, DC, if people tested, they would find out where their problems at long before. They had the problem. Yep. Yeah, we love the uh, the panic calls from customers saying, <laughs> "My my network's not working." You guys get them even more than than we do, but we often get them after they've talked to you and they say, "Oh, well, you've got latency. Of course, it's not going to work." And then they're like, "No, what do I do? I just spent a billion dollars on my VoIP system and we tested it on our local network and it was it was wonderful. It had this perfect quality. We had video. Everything was working. And then we put it out, you know, to to Singapore and." Nobody could hear anything, and the calls kept dropping. What do we do now? Well, yeah. Uh, please test before you put it out on your network. And, uh, well, if you can't do that, um, you've got my phone number. We're happy to FedEx you a, uh, a test tool <laughs> the next day. Yeah, that's one of those rut rows. You know, they, they, uh, and then, of course, their diagnostics is based upon a, their visualization through a span port, which right. cleans up real-time protocols and makes it look wonderful. See, Danny, I got in. A oh, D, a here D. we go. <laughs> go, Tim. <laughs> but no, that's a reality. People test, and then they still look at their network through a device that filters it. I mean, what's with that? Why don't you use it and look at really what's going on? Then any testing you do is viable, not filtered and flawed from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, we're 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 way past the no, not way past, but we're we're we passed the half hour mark. Um, and the reason I want to uh, keep it more or less half an hour is that a lot of these really te good technical shows, um, you know, people actually might might not uh, watch it if it's if it's too long. They they think that uh, they just don't have the time. Um, so I like to kind of keep it short. Um, so uh, Chris joined us. Um, uh, and I didn't have a chance to introduce him. And I wonder if I could put him on the spot and, and have him comment on on the benefit of vendors, um, you know, doing uh, focusing on on technology as opposed to just the brand and, and uh, marketing. Uh, Chris, what do you think? Yeah, first I can say DC, great presentation. Thank yeah, you. Anytime uh, you can do the educational points and uh, teach on. Uh, different technologies and what's happening and so trending, so that, that's great. I uh, thought it was very informative. And uh, Danny, to answer your question, uh, you know, in terms of technology, uh, yeah, I think it's great. I think it's, you know, educating people on best practices, methodologies is, is a great way to go and I, I think that's one thing, you know, we really try to push is, you know, let, let's educate on what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, quite frankly, it's it's the whiteboard, I call it, right? I mean, that's, you know, if, if anything, I'm going to live on the whiteboard. You know, let's talk about what you're doing today, what you're trying to do tomorrow, where you're trying to go uh, with your networking requirements, your application requirements, but whatever you're trying to do, I think that's that's the ultimate, is going with a blank whiteboard and where are you today and where you're going. And, and I think uh, as a vendor, technologist, uh, 
sorry, I just mm-hmm. moved over to my uh, application there. But I, I think that's, you know, the important thing is, is go in with that blank whiteboard philosophy. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then we can, one, listen and learn. Because you got to know where people are at, where their starting point is, where they're trying to go. So, you know, for me, that that's kind of how, you know, I, I work with customers, I work with partners, I work with, uh, you know, technologists when we're reviewing things, when we're looking at new products, you know, go, go to the whiteboard. And, uh, you know, it's a simple statement, but uh, I think that's where you got to start a lot of times. And, and, mm-hmm. uh, and that's, where, where, that's where all my meetings go, Danny, is yeah. you know, the customer. Yeah. Uh, show me what you have. Show me what you're doing. What are you trying to accomplish? And yeah. and, and really listen. And really just listen. listen. Exactly, it is. It's, yeah. it's starting with uh, listening and understanding. Mm-hmm. And until you oh. do that, you, you can't yeah. move to the next step. Yeah. No matter what that's you're right. selling or what you're making or or what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 really good advice. Thank you, thank you, Chris. And uh, and and thanks for coming to the show. And uh, so with that, I'm going to thank uh, Tony. Thanks, Tim. Tim, and uh, once again, uh, uh, thank DC. So your next show, you're going to be doing this live from Japan in the onsen <laughs> with the portable PC and and Steve's coming from your uh, background. Vol- uh, volcano I think, I'll, I think down, I'll right? wait till I get back. <laughs> I Darn. think I want to enjoy soaking in the hot tub. <laughs> well, have that. Have have, uh, have great fun. Enjoy Thanks. the food. The uh, uh, everything about it. Okay. All okay. right. Thank you, everybody. Right. Thank you, thank Thanks, you, DC. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, awesome. everyone. And um, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye, bye.